uh, mimickers of urticaria, one fairly common or relatively common one, urticarial vasculitis, and then at least for my practice of medicine, a bunch of exceedingly rare diseases that I've never seen or I've missed them throughout my whole career. Uh, some rare auto-inflammatory diseases that can masquerade as urticaria. So Kez, uh, go right ahead. Yeah, all right. Well, thanks, Len. Uh, again, my name is Kes Oakstolis. Uh, I'm, uh, I just finished a, a fellowship at UW this past summer and, um, and uh, started at Northwest Asthma and Allergy and I'm primarily out of Everett and Redmond. Um, so getting my feet wet for jumping right in the deep end, uh, seeing patients and enjoying it. And um, and so today I'll be pre presenting this topic, mimickers of urticaria and urticarial vasculitis and auto-inflammatory diseases. And, um, and from the allergist immunologist perspective, uh, and if there are any rheumatologists or dermatologists out there, feel free to jump in at any point to give clarification or pointers. Um, but all of us, I know I saw it in training and already um, you see many cases of chronic spontaneous urticaria, chronic idiopathic urticaria, and they kind of roll through the office and you trial them on high dose antihistamines and see if it works. Um, but um, we always obviously need to be thinking about other things as well and making sure other um, things don't fall through the cracks and we don't miss out on catching these patients who might have more nuanced presentations uh, and maybe even respond to some of the medications that we throw at them that treat chronic spontaneous urticaria. So um, make sure to catch the wolf dressed in sheep's clothing, uh, trying to masquerade as just spontaneous urticaria. <clears throat> so uh, no disclosures. Uh, and then again, we'll differentiate. Um, hopefully I'll do a good job for you to, for those who are learning about this, uh, to learn about the different presentations of all these entities. Um, and uh, for those of you who've been practicing, just uh, hopefully a reminder and a refresher on uh, many of these things that we should be looking out for. So again, just briefly, just briefly touching on the chronic spontaneous urticaria, the typical classic presentation. Um, typically, you'll get this recurrent urticaria, angioedema, or both, six weeks or longer. Um, and it, it, it affects a large portion of the population. We, and I've seen this in the literature looking up this topic. So about 1% of the population in the United States, and that's similar in the European literature as well, affecting uh, patients from Europe. Um, and uh, I didn't see any other demographic data from other areas necessarily. Um, and we'll have that Classic wheel uh, and flare, central swelling uh, with surrounding erythema, a lot of pruritus, worse at night. Uh, and the lesions are typically fleeting, so they kind of migrate all over the body. About They can be present in a single location for 30 minutes and up to about 24 hours, and typically don't leave any markings after they go away. So. Um, and respond in general to antihistamines. At least you'll be able to modulate the symptoms a little bit uh, unless they're very severe. And then based on all the guidelines, we always go to second generation antihistamines, increasing the dose of that up to four times um, the recommended, uh, up to four times the daily dose. Uh, and then ultimately to omalizumab is kind of where we've uh, kind of headed with managing these patients. Uh, so that's kind of the classic throughput that we see in a lot of our offices and many cases of that. But then there are these other things that can present very similarly. So urticarial vasculitis and then the auto-inflammatory diseases. And specifically, I'll touch on the cryopyrin-associated periodic syndromes of CAPS, is what I'll be referring to. And then uh, Schnitzler syndrome uh, specifically. And then familial cold auto-inflammatory syndrome type 2 uh, associated with NLRP12, uh, which is associated hereditary periodic fever syndrome. So FCAS2, I'll refer to that. And then um, uh, PLC gamma 2 associated antibody deficiency and immune dysregulation, also known as PLAD. So um, that's something for the fellows and it's on the boards. You'll see this stuff. 
even though you may not see it in practice. So, um, so just the definition, uh, urticarial vasculitis. So you'll have these urticarial plaques and the skin pathology findings of leukocytoclastic vasculitis is the, the definition of it. And so um, typically in histopathology, you'll, show, you'll see endothelial swelling, neutrophil interfiltration of the wall of uh, small vessels typically. And on immunofluorescence, you'll see um, deposition of complement in the um, upper dermal capillaries uh, typically. So, uh, so the demographics of urticarial vasculitis a lot of times it'll, the onset, we see the median onset being at about 45 years of age. Um, urticarial vasculitis in children seems to be very rare. It's in case reports and 1% um, and, and of the children who have vasculitis have urticarial vasculitis. So again, pretty rare. Um, and then as far as additional demographic information, <laughs> the best thing I could find was a reference to uh, the, a group out of Sweden just looked at a, a point prevalence number and it was 9.5 per million in December of 2015. And that was the best kind of number that I can find out how many people end up having this. Um, so with the pathophysiology, again, it's more of a um, immune complex problem. So you'll get this antigen antibody complex that deposits itself in the vessel walls, leading to activation of the classical complement pathway. Um, and you get this mast cell degranulation via C3A and C5A um, through the classical complement pathway. And you lead to these unique uh, urticarial plaque formations uh, and all symptoms associated with it. And so that being said, because it is a complement mediated process. Um, you can see a spectrum of this disease uh, correlating specifically to its severity. So the majority of patients will present as normal complementemic uh, urticarial vasculitis, where you'll see normal uh, complement levels. And they think about 80% of the patients will have this uh, normal complementemic urticarial vasculitis. But if you ever see a patient and they have uh, low complement, and, vas uh, and urticarial vasculitis, um, that should kind of trigger you to think about other systemic involvement as this is more associated with a consumptive process. It's consumptive hypocomplementemia, and it's, it's very possible that you're gonna have other organ systems involved, uh, and you'll need to investigate that further and involve potentially other subspecialties, and we'll get into the specifics. So, <laughs> The clinical presentation of urticarial vasculitis, again, the plaques are going to be longer typically. The specific plaques in one specific location will typically last longer than 24 hours in a location and can last up to several days. Um, so unlike chronic spontaneous urticaria, where it kind of goes away within hours and maybe max up to a day, this stuff lingers around in a single location. Um, Urticarial vasculitis can be pruritic, uh, although up to 33% report pain associated with these lesions as well. So if patients are at all complaining that they're, you know, they're super itchy, but it actually kind of hurts sometimes, and it's not just from scratching them open. Uh, that should also potentially uh, be a red flag for you. And, it, and um, these patients can present with angioedema as well, and up to half of them presenting with angioedema. Um, other kind of presentations that can be associated with it are purpura uh, and levita reticularis. So uh, these kind of lacy rashes that uh, you can see here in the picture. And that's another way that you can see this kind of, um, hopefully that shows up for everybody, but you can see that it can also present with this type of rash as well. <clears throat> and so these are some good depictions. Um, Davis has a good review uh, in his group of the presentations of urticular vasculitis in uh, 2018. Um, actually, it, it's what it's called as mimickers of urticaria. Um, but again, with urticarial vasculitis, you'll see these urticarial plaques that can be very much um, initially potentially appearing kind of like chronic spontaneous urticaria. But then uh, as you see in figures B and C, you'll see many times this dusky pigmentation that is left over after the hive or the urticarial plaque has uh, receded and gone away. And so you'll get 
um, and even sometimes some uh, purpuric patches at the sites of where these lesions were previously, as you'll see in uh, picture D. <clears throat> and then another depiction that I found commonly represented in the literature are these, um, you'll notice that it's not a classic wheel and flare appearance. Um, you'll see more of a well demarcated erythematous border and a central pallor, but it doesn't have that classic wheel on top of it uh, necessarily with this edema that you might see in chronic spontaneous urticaria. <clears throat> and so what we'll see on biopsy typically with uh, urticarial vasculitis is again, you'll have vessel damage. This is, this is gonna be the primary way that you're gonna diagnose this is with biopsy. So um, you'll see vessel damage involving the post-capillary venules and you'll see fragmentation of leukocytes with nuclear debris, fibrinoid deposits, uh, perivascular infiltrates, and again, primarily with neutrophil, uh, neutrophils there, and extravasation of uh, red blood cells, and injury and swelling of endothelial cells, and deposition of complement and immunoglobulins in the vessel walls. And so you'll see these findings uh, on histology. And a group out of Germany looked at um, specifically um, what are going to be the most telling findings on histopathology that we have urticaria vasculitis and what they found was uh, leukocytoclasia uh, was present in 76% of urticaria vasculitis as opposed to only up to 4% of chronic spontaneous urticaria and erythrocyte extravasation in 41% as opposed to 2% with um, the chronic spontaneous urticaria and you'll get the fibrin deposits in up to 28% of urticaria vasculitis as opposed to like 10% with chronic spontaneous urticaria. So those three factors specifically are the ones that are gonna differentiate urticaria vasculitis from chronic spontaneous urticaria um, uh, on histopathology. <clears throat> and those are the best predictors. And this group was actually trying to create a way to um, score, have a scoring system uh, to predict the likelihood of uh, urticarial vasculitis uh, based on histopathology results. And they found that these three were the most sensitive and specific to dif differentiate um, from um, chronic spontaneous urticaria on histopathology. <clears throat> so going back to the disease process, so up to 50% of these patients will at some point have systemic disease associated with their urticarial vasculitis. And so um, that could be musculoskeletal up to half of those patients with systemic presentation. Uh, if you have a patient with this urticarial vasculitis, you can have glomerular nephritis, renal involvement, proteinuria. Um, but pulmonary, if you have uh, pulmonary involvement, that's actually one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in patients with urticarial vasculitis. And so a lot of times you can see an emphysematous uh, uh, lung disease, uh, vasculitis, especially if you have vasculitis involving the lung tissue. So if you have a patient with urticarial vasculitis, or you think you have a patient with chronic spontaneous urticaria, but all of a sudden an out of control, quote, asthma that's unusual and it doesn't behaving the way we think they should be behaving on asthma medications uh, should trigger you maybe to think about, you know, is this something more uh, urticaria vasculitis type with pulmonary involvement <clears throat> as well. So with GI, a lot of times uh, it can present with in up to 33% of patients um, and with hepatomegaly and splenomegaly as well. And many of these patients, and not as many, but up to 10% uh, will have ocular involvement with conjunctivitis, uveitis, episcleritis as well. So, and then with cardiac involvement, urological involvement, endocrine involvement as well. So um, truly a multi-system, um, you know, wherever you can get vasculitis, you can have that organ system affected uh, in a way. So having uh, a broader, um, you know, net to cast with these patients and making sure that you keep other systemic diseases on your different. Yes, I have a question. Yeah. Now the comment you just made about, you know, the uh, leukocytoclastic vasculitis in com combination with pulmonary disease, mm -hmm. you know, would make you confused a little bit with EGPA, but this is a neutrophilic disease. Yeah. 
uh, not an eosinophilic disease in the vas vascularity, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. yeah. And biopsy, you don't see EOs. No, not typically, no. not with this. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Um, and so with this immune complex mediated disease process, um, many of these cases will be, and they think that the majority of these cases will be idiopathic uh, with no clear uh, association, but medications that have been implicated uh, with this, um, uh, this chelating agent, uh, uh, Defirazox, and, uh, it, it's used for um, hemosiderosis associated with uh, chronic transfusions uh, or Enterocept, uh, Etanercept uh, has also been implicated. Um, and then other infections have also been implicated with uh, leading to urticarial vasculitis, so Lyme disease, hepatitis, Epstein-Barr, neurosister sarcosis. And then um, COVID seems to be rearing its head in a variety of places, but it is seen uh, specifically in patients who are presenting with this um, multi-system inflammatory uh, syndrome in children and adolescents too. And they'll present with this kind of leukocytoclastic, uh, these leukocytoclastic findings on their rashes that they find. So you'll get that kind of presentation as well. So if you get an adolescent with um, unusual urticary after a COVID infection or, or maybe it, in, in some of these case reports, that was the initiate, initial presentation of them as well. Um, so, um, and then associated things as well. So uh, lupus, up to 20% of patients with lupus will have urticarial vasculitis and then Sjogren's syndrome as well. Uh, you'll see this uh, entity present as well. And then malignancy is always on the differential as in urticarial vasculitis being the presenting um, uh, thing that they can present with a lot of these malignancies as well. And then also it's been seen in case reports with uh, Crohn's disease and um, ulcerative colitis that you'll see urticovasculitis be a presenting um, uh, or an associated finding in these patients as well. <clears throat> so if you have truly in, in this one paper, uh, the recommended studies, if you have a patient with urticovasculitis, you know, getting a CBC and CMP, um, basically checking for systemic involvement uh, and also having rheumatolo uh, rheumatological entities on your differential as well. A PFT and a chest x-ray, again, going back to that pulmonary involvement and then age appropriate screenings for malignancy as well. <clears throat> So for urticarial vasculitis, there's no clear guidelines for management that have been established, kind of like chronic spontaneous urticaria. And so a lot of medications have been thrown around and they're mostly immunosuppressants uh, that have been found to be effective. Um, so hydroxychloroquine and colchicine have been seen to be as, as, as effective as corticosteroids as first line therapy. However, antihistamines, not effective. So in that patient with chronic, that you think has chronic spontaneous urticaria, and they are absolutely not responding at all to antihistamines, um, something to think about here. Um, and then we have, if you have refractory urticarial vasculitis, there are kind of more advanced immunomodulatory medications that you can throw at these patients, uh, and, and for the most part can be tough to manage. Um, <laughs> And some of the other data I found, um, uh, corticosteroids seem to be as effective in, in more than 80% of these patients. So in these patients, sometimes you come in and, and um, whether, you know, other providers or they're only, they're not responsive to antihistamines and they're only responsive to corticosteroids. Again, it should be something to pause and think about or to cure vasculitis in these patients. And then, um, Again, antihistamine is not effective, and Montelukast is also not effective in these patients. And this group took a look at the variety of medications that have been um, used to treat patients with urticovasculitis. And as you can see, um, things in green uh, and or kind of in orange um, have either partial or complete. Um, lead to complete or partial remission um, 
uh, for or to kill vasculitis and steroids. Again, as you can see, being one of the better ones uh, to, to treat patients with uh, along with these other medications. But uh, interestingly enough, um, what I wanted to, you know, again, we're kind of practicing in these patients with chronic spontaneous urticaria go on these pathways of treatment. And, you know, we sometimes think like, they're, oh, they're not responding to antihistamines as well, or maybe we try to say they're not being, but one thing, and then we put them on Zoller and all of a sudden, they respond really nicely, like, oh, okay, we're chronic spontaneous urticaria. Well, with Zoller, with omalizumab, uh, specifically, um, there was this proof of concept study uh, out of China, and they looked at some things that I want to point about the study, but ultimately they found that up to 75% of patients with normal complementemic urticariovasculitis responded to omalizumab. And granted, this was an open label trial. 87% of these patients were female. Um, and up to, they said like 74% of these patients responded either partially or completely to um, omalizumab. And the ones who had the higher IgE levels tended to respond better than the ones who had lower ones. And they, the, the group here proposed that um, omalizumab was working on vasculitis by basically um, uh, acting on these IgE autoantibodies um, and preventing mast cells from releasing IL-1 beta leading to urticarial, you know, part of this presentation of urticarial vasculitis. And so um, I just found this to be interesting in that, <laughs> um, and for me, at least personally, I think I'll think about the patients who I might feel more reassured about that they're responding to omalizumab and maybe always think about, well, why is this not necessarily urticarial vasculitis? You know, are we sure that this is still chronic spontaneous urticaria? Because at least, and, and again, this is not an extensive study, but um, you know, something to think about <laughs> that this data is out there. So. Hey, Ken, Ken is yeah. another question. Since this is an immune complex complement activated disease, mm -hmm. why are there patients who are normal complementemic if they're consuming complement? So the way that I understood it was more of the extent of disease involvement. So if there was just more systemic involvement, you'll have lower complement levels, um, you know, as opposed to um, if they just have um, skin manifestation with no systemic involvement, that's when most of these patients will present with normal complementemic urticarial vasculitis. Uh, they're just not enough surface area that they're consuming complement to get below the. That's what. That's how I range. interpret. Yeah, that's how yeah. I'm interpreting um, that information. Yeah. Is that a clinically useful sign? If you're normal complementemic, you have less severe disease, you're less likely to have lupus or cancer. Can you use it diagnostically? I didn't see that specifically. Um, I just, it's a, it's to me, I interpreted that as more of a, a severity, a, a, a marker for disease severity. So if you have urticarial vasculitis uh, and you have low complement, uh, on your labs, uh, then you should go looking for a systemic involvement is kind of the way I um, interpreted that. Yeah, okay, that's what I was saying, I yeah. agree. Yeah, <clears throat> and, and on that note, pretty much so, um, if you have, uh, you know, kind of, again, kind of your screening patients who have chronic spontaneous urticaria, um, and you find that one of the big things that stand out when you compare these two groups, urticarial vasculitis versus um, chronic spontaneous urticaria, the things that really stand out are gonna be that complement level. So if you have a low C3 or a low C4, you just don't see that with chronic spontaneous urticaria. And so you should really think hard about urticarial vasculitis in these patients. Um, and uh, again, the thing that stands out with these uh, patients with urticariovasculitis or the residual hyperpigmentation that's lasting beyond 24 hours or, or the, the wheels and the hives that are lasting um, beyond 24 hours. So, um, and then you will see elevated CRP as well in these patients. But as you can see, a lot of these things are, are pretty similar. So, 
statistically speaking. So, because even in urticarial vasculitis, a lot of these patients will present with pruritus. So, um, uh, and, and angioedema. So, uh, it can be pretty similar. <clears throat> and so, again, just kind of reviewing all the the differential between classical and urticarial vasculitis. Um, all the things that we we kind of went over here. So <laughs> moving on to um, urticaria, uh, urticarial plaques, and uh, presentation with autoinflammatory diseases, um, you know, we'll kind of go through these specific um, autoinflammatory diseases and specifically focusing more on the innate immune system um, uh, with uh, inflammasomes, and we'll get into the weeds with that. So with, uh, with CAPS, uh, so the cryopyrin-associated periodic uh, syndrome, uh, fever syndrome. So before there were these uh, things like familial cold autoinflammatory syndrome, muckle well syndrome, and neonatal onset multi-system inflammatory disease. And these are all thought to be separate entities. Um, but now they're, they're really trying to focus on uh, the reframing uh, this as more of a spectrum of disease and dysregulation uh, or mutation in the NLRP3 um, gene, which regulates the inflammasome. And we'll kind of get into that a little bit, um, but really uh, viewing these patients uh, as on a spectrum of disease. So who are these patients and what's, uh, what are their uh, definitions? So, um, these are patients, um, this is, these are rare diseases. So um, uh, the prevalence is about, they think two to five per 1 million. Um, although it's really hard to measure how many of these people. So a lot of these patients will have cold induced urticarial plaques. And so um, they think that we may be missing a lot of these presentations because if you live in a warmer climate and you're never exposed to cold, um, you may not have this presentation necessarily. Uh, and um, you'll see a lot of this uh, familial cold uh, autoinflammatory syndrome, primarily in North America and Europe. And again, it's kind of where it's colder. And, and is that why we're picking up more of these patients in these climates? Um, and <laughs> so with NLRP3, so this is a gene that's associated um, with uh, in an inflammasome, um, and I'll get into what that is here in a little bit, but basically um, the genetics of this process is important to understand because um, there are a variety of mutations that have been seen in this spectrum of diseases to this specific gene, and it can <laughs> drive kind of the severity of illness. And so what we know, and there's a spectrum of, um, variants that are found in uh, genetic disorders. So you can find uh, that it's likely path it's a likely pathogenic mutation in a gene uh, versus uh, a variant of uncertain significant of VUS. Um, but as of November, there were a hundred of these mutations specifically that are thought to be pathogenic that lead to this spectrum of, kind of cold induced autoinflammatory conditions that are associated with urticaria. And what, we, what they're finding is that even when they determine that certain mutations have variants of uncertain significance, so some patients will have mutations and not have any symptoms, uh, but those patients who do have these specific mutations and have symptoms, they tend to present with uh, headache, uh, urticaria, arthralgia, and severe GI symptoms. And, um, and so the, the types of genetic mutations in the specific gene will determine um, kind of this very uh, varied phenotypic presentation of this spectrum of uh, diseases. So uh, kind of, I, I think it would have been helpful to know this in the beginning, uh, but basically what is an LRP3? So NLRP3 is uh, a gene that ultimately forms this, uh, it's part of the innate immune system. So um, it ultimately, this gene directs the, um, uh, the formation of this inflammasome uh, 
And this inflammasome is in this uh, picture is depicted as kind of this pinwheel appearing structure uh, that is assembled uh, with the help of NLRP3 directing it and a few other mediators. But ultimately, it's responsible for uh, ultimately leading to IL-1, um, the release of IL-1 beta and IL-18, which then leads to NF-kappa beta and then releases further inflammatory cytokines. And so what you see with this mutation and this patient in the spectrum of disease with CAPS um, is a mutation, it's a gain of function mutation. So you get this, the volume is turned up, if you will, on this gene, and it's overproducing these inflammatory uh, CAS uh, mediators um, <coughs> that leads to um, um, all these inflammatory uh, related illnesses and amyloidos amyloidosis and um, and primarily these diseases the the presentation of these flares is triggered by cold uh, typically um, and so the clinical manifestation of this uh, disease is typically you can have multi-system in, in, inflammation uh, and um, you'll see patients will have kind of relapsing and remitting disease. So depending on if they're exposed to cold frequently or not, um, uh, or other stressors. Um, and, and some patients do report uh, in just over half of the patients, a chronic disease uh, in these patients. Um, so, and, and the duration of these flares uh, can last less than 24 hours to more than three days. And again, the triggers for these can be cold, stress, psychological stress, infections, trauma, lack of sleep. And so um, in the more mild phenotype of the FCAS, um, these inflammatory flares can be more frequent in the winter time uh, on damp and windy days and following exposure to um, air conditioning as well, even can trigger. So how do we diagnose CAPS? So uh, clinically speaking, uh, to pick up on these patients, um, you have to see um, elevated CRP, and then at least two of the six clinical characteristics, um, whether it's those urticarial rash, um, cold and stress uh, triggered flares, so you'll get more urticaria than associated um, arthralgias, myalgias um, as well. And then in the more severe phenotypes, you can see skeletal abnormalities. And these severe phenotypes are typically seen in infancy uh, in, in uh, neonatal onset inflammatory uh, disease. And you'll have skeletal ab abnormalities in these patients as well uh, with these kind of, um, with, with frontal bossing uh, and epiphyseal um, overgrowth, uh, overgrowth of the growth plates. And you'll see this kind of cupping, as you can see uh, on these radiographs in more severe disease. And so for the purposes of um, research, they've kind of further classified these uh, patients in the different uh, uh, classifications for CAP. So whether or not you have a known pathogenic variant of NLRP3 and at least one of the clinical manifestations, so urticarial rash can be that, a red eye and you're essentially hearing loss as well. Uh, and then you have um, additional criteria for patients who have these variants of uncertain significance, <laughs> and uh, then you'll need a, a few more clinical findings to, to uh, meet the clinical criteria. And um, you also have some patients who um, they're still trying to find uh, NLRP3 uh, gene variants. And um, so, and so how does that genetic defect cause urticaria? What's the link between the gene and the skin manifestation? So I, I can't explain that. I don't know necessarily because it. I, I think it's an urticarial-like lesion because they're more painful. I think um, what I found to be initially confusing, you know, reading up on this, it. it, it, it I ultimately think it's a it's a separate dermatological presentation than like a classic urticaria. You'll get these rashes that are urticaria-like appearance and they're more painful and um and sensitive to touch and so um i, I think that 
is maybe a better explanation. I don't, you know, in the classic like mast cell degranulation, you know, having urticaria, I don't think it's that specific, but it's all this spectrum of disease has always fallen under quote urticaria like and urticaria like presentation. So um, I'm not, you know, so that, that's what, what, what do you see if you biopsy the rash? So typically you'll see um, a neutrophilic infiltrate, I think, off the top. Um, and again, it's not, um, that. that's what I remember from it. So let me go back. Um, so you get these erythematous uh, papules and plaques. They're rarely pruritic. Uh, and again, they're very sensitive to touch and they're often painful to touch as well. Um, and and when you compare it to the chronic spontaneous urticaria, as you can see up top on, on A, um, you'll you'll have these wheel you'll have a wheel and flare um, as opposed to in caps it's it's a much flat more flat lesion that you'll see with with caps so uh, and so ultimately with caps. Um, diagnoses, the goal is to suppress the systemic inflammation and improve functionality and prevent organ damage uh, and improve patient's quality of life. Uh, and so that's done primarily through um, anti-IL-1 medication. So again, with that inflammasome um, uh, cascade, if you will, um, you're ultimately trying to block the effects of IL-1 through these specific medications. So whether it's um, anakinra, kinumab, and um, rolonicept uh, specifically, but anakinra has been the primary uh, uh, medication that I've seen uh, in the literature treating these patients. <clears throat> so, uh, and then specifically with anakinra, it seems to have the best penetrance uh, uh, to treat aseptic meningitis in these patients because it has the best CNS penetration. Uh, and then with these patients, the thing that you're trying to prevent is um, amyloidosis, uh, ultimately. Uh, so, And so just comparing these uh, different phenotypes, um, the onset typically, um, it can change between each of the phenotypes specifically. Uh, and in the mild and the moderate phenotypes, you'll see kind of a wide ranging presentation of, of the time of onset. So it can be anywhere from childhood to adulthood, but the severe phenotype is typically perinatal. So, um, and um, you'll many times see family history in the mild and more moderate phenotypes, but you'll have um, in the severe phenotype, um, you'll have de novo mutations that typically manifest that way. So, um, so in, in, the, in the NICU, if you see this or, or uh, early uh, perinatal presentations, not, they won't necessarily be a family history. Um, and so <clears throat> um, with the duration of, of the inflammatory flares, it'll range from uh, just a few hours to a few days to, again, the more, pheno the, the more severe phenotype, you're going to have persistent inflammation and these persistent symptoms. And um, with, um, with cold-induced um, symptoms in urticaria, you're going to see it more so with the mild phenotype uh, as opposed to the moderate or severe phenotype. Because again, you're going to have more chronic symptoms with a severe phenotype. And so um, with the dermatological manifestation, so it, it is the neutrophilic urticaria. So it is a neutrophilic uh, kind of presentation uh, with a dermatological presentation. And, um, the, um, and then you can have fevers associated with these flares. Um, so, and you can see the flare, the, the fevers associated up to six to 24 hours after cold exposure, um, especially in the mild phenotypes. And then you'll have ocular involvement, um, musculoskeletal involvement, CNS involvement as well uh, for these patients with just more severe presentation as you progress to more severe phenotype of this disease. 
And so moving on to uh, Schnitzler syndrome. So this um, is an entity that we think it is mediated by overproduction of IL-1, but I, there's, um, from what I saw in the literature, they haven't necessarily attributed it to the NLRP3 gene. So it's, it's, it still stands alone as a separate entity uh, from the CAPS uh, presentation. And typically with this, uh, this clinically presents typically in the fifth decade of life. So in your 50s, um, you'll get these chronic recurrent non pyritic plaques they typically persist for 24 hours and then resolve um, without any kind of residual pigmentation. So as compared to urticarial vasculitis, um, the, you, you will not see a, a residual um, pigmentation. So patients will present with fever, arthralgia, arthritis, bone pain, lymphadenopathy. And the biggest thing that stands out with this is uh, monoclonal paraproteinemia. Um, typically, it's IgM that is uh, the, the predominant immunoglobulin that stands out. <clears throat> so, um, and again, so with this, uh, it is unresponsive to antihistamines and corticosteroids um, as much and, and primarily treated with uh, IL-1 uh, inhibitors. And um, so given the IL-1 involvement. So the diagnostic criteria um, are, uh, have been outlined. So you'll have, patients have to have chronic urticarial rash and monoclonal IgM or IgG and the majority being IgM um, spikes. And with these additional uh, minor criteria, um, uh, so you'll have recurrent fever, um, you'll have evidence of bone remodeling, uh, neutrophilic dermal infiltrate on skin biopsy and um, leukocytosis and elevated CRP as well. Um, and so it's a definite diagnosis if you have both obligate criteria and two minor criteria. Um, uh, and so, and, and, and probable diagnosis, and if you have the two obligate and at least one of the minor criteria. So that's primarily how it's been diagnosed. Uh, but I don't know if anyone out there has seen this specifically. It's pretty, this is one of the more rare conditions. So, and so on histopathology, you'll see a little bit more of a mixed infiltrate. Uh, you know, you'll see mixed um, lymphocytes, eosinophils, and neutrophils, um, and then just diffuse spart mixed inflammatory interstitial infiltrate with accompanying uh, dermal edema as well. <clears throat> And so treatment for Schnitzler syndrome is going to be primarily anakinra, focusing on the IL-1 pathway specifically. And so moving on to um, FCAS type 2. So it's through a slightly different mechanism than the CAPS um, mechanism. So um, then the FCAS um, that's associated with CAPS. It's through NLRP12 um, and not NLRP3. Uh, and th these patients uh, um, have typically a um, more of a loss of function. So this gene, NLRP12, is, is lost. And what NLRP12 does is a, it's a negative regulator, ultimately, of NF-kappa B. And so when you have mutations in this, um, the brakes will come off, if you will, and you'll have increased inflammatory um, symptoms. And so this uh, also uh, typically presents with um, these episodic fevers, arthralgias, myalgias, um, all induced by generalized cold exposure. And this is perinatally uh, seen <clears throat> specifically. And so moving on to plaid, um, this is an additional auto-inflammatory dis uh, disease. Uh, it's autosomally dominant. It's induced you know, with cold urticaria, uh, but it's also associated with, with recurrent bacterial infection and autoimmunity and ultimately skin granuloma formation as well. <clears throat> so um, with these patients specifically, uh, the urticaria is induced more specifically with evaporative cooling. So um, patients will present with, um, you know, uh, 
after kids, after crying, when their tears are drying off, they'll present with urticaria in the place where their tears were uh, uh, previously. And with these patients, you'll actually see an, a negative uh, ice cube test um, with immediately following the ice cube test. But again, it's, it's more of an evaporative process. Um, and you'll see urticaria induced as the, the uh, temperature of the skin is rewarming to room temperature and it's more of an evaporative cooling effect. And that's what induces these uh, hives. The reactions are localized uh, as opposed to FCAS type two uh, that I just talked about, which is more um, systemic involvement. And again, these patients will many times um, present. Um, I saw that though in infancy, they can't present with having cyanosis if not placed under the warmer, but um, some of these patients have presented with just being on a swing uh, and the breeze, the cool breeze is hitting their face and they'll have urticaria form on their face where there's, again, that evaporative cooling effect taking place. <clears throat> and so the other component with this is gonna be the recurrent infections. And so you'll have sinopulmonary infections, uh, early onset shingles, onychomycosis, uh, and um, typically, the immunological workup will show low IgM and, uh, and low circulating um, switched memory B cells, uh, but many also have low IgA uh, and low uh, natural killer cells as well. So if you're basically <laughs> seeing patients with evaporative urticaria with low IgM A, or IgA and low NK cells, we should think about this. And then also poor responses to pneumococcal vaccines as well. <clears throat> so, and um, these patients also um, will present with uh, many times with uh, autoimmunity as well. And they'll, many of them will have a positive ANA uh, and also have autoimmune thyroiditis and vitiligo as well. <clears throat> and so, Kind of looking at the spectrum of these auto-inflammatory diseases as a summary, um, the, um, the ultimate uh, presentation of, of these symptoms will, will be cold-induced urticaria, specifically leading to these more uh, pronounced flares, if you will, of myalgias, arthralgias, and some of the CNS involvement, depending on severity. Um, and um, and many of the sustained and progressive symptoms, as you can see, overlap with sensory neural hearing loss seen in both FCAS type two and muckle, kind of the more um, uh, moderate to severe phenotypes of um, the CAPS syndrome with, um, and uh, so it's that. And then specifically differentiating the different types of um, the cold-induced urticarial disorders. So some things to just think about um, is um, typically, is with the ice cube test specifically, uh, is that with the, um, the FCAS type uh, and um, uh, the CAPS type syndromes, the ice cube test many times will be negative on them. And again, it's due to um, the induction, like you induce these urticarial lesions and flares through more of a evaporative process as opposed to direct cold stimulation. So, um, and then anytime that you see a patient who has these kind of cold induced urticarial spells and then subsequently have um, these more rheumatological presentations or neurological presentations with headaches and fatigue and aches and pains everywhere, um, these are additional kind of disorders to think about um, for these patients. So, and so um, the, again, in summary, um, with, it, with comparing and contrasting chronic urticaria, like just the classic thing that we see uh, many times um, between the auto-inflammatory syndrome, again, just reiterating um, that with chronic urticaria, you'll have these um, papular wheels and you get a wheel and flare reactions as opposed to more flat urticarial lesions with the appearance of them. And then the duration of these lesions will, will be a lot longer. And so if you have longer lasting urticarial lesions and these lesions in a single location, 
uh, we should be thinking about things other than uh, just root kind of what we think of as routine chronic uh, urticaria. And so, uh, and ultimately, um, the other telling thing is that these patients, if, if you have patients who are not responding at all to any antihistamine, um, uh, to, to always think about these other entities, whether it's auto-inflammatory um, syndromes or um, urticarial vasculitis as well. So, uh, so hopefully, um, I gave something for everyone to think about. And uh, as we think about our patients every day coming through the office, uh, and um, yeah, happy to answer any questions. Yes, thanks uh, very much. Um, uh, just crossed my mind with the CAP syndromes, that's a gain of function in a gene, right? Yeah. There are a lot of abnormalities, but like about 100 of them cause the disease. So why does the disease turn on and off? If you have a gain of function gene working all the time, why do you have attacks and why do they end? Um, my understanding is more of... Uh, depending on the the penetrant like uh, the penetrance of the the genetic mutation uh it'll affect how much regulation there is of of these reactions so the different types of genetic mutations that, that's why you just have a, such a wide varying phenotype of the presentations uh is um uh, due to that so um yeah i, I otherwise don't <laughs> Really, I, I, I didn't yeah. think you'd know the answer. It yeah. just struck me like if you have a, a gene that's a gain of functions that was working all the time, you would speculate perhaps you're turned on all the time. You're, you're, um, you have activation. Yeah. I, I'm just curious, um, anybody out there manage these patients? Oh, do, we, do we see <laughs> them or do the rheumatologists see them? Oh, okay. Are you going to pull that? Anybody manage any of these diseases? Rennie? Yeah, no, I, I don't see any of these really. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, no, I, I haven't encountered any of them. Well, when we were training, these diseases didn't exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At least we didn't have any idea what, what what, what it was. Anybody else out there in the audience? Well, I have a question. I don't manage these, but I was just questioning, Kess, when do you feel the time to biopsy these people is? I mean, usually when I try steroids and they don't work and I raise the dose and it still doesn't work, then I'll usually biopsy them after that, but I have the derm folks biopsy them. So when do you use that part of your process? I think for me, especially, I mean, I'm, um, I think I'll, I'll be, if, if they are minimally responsive, if I cannot modulate them, they're the patients with chronic spontaneous urticaria that um, for the most part, I find even the ones that end up going on Zoller, they somewhat respond to antihistamines. Um, but it, if they tell me that on, even on high dose antihistamines, nothing, absolutely nothing changed, I, I think I'll have a much lower threshold to, to send them for biopsy. Uh, for me, uh, and then also, uh, I think another trigger for me would be uh, any uh, low complement, so C3 or C4 being low, that's gonna, for me, be a, a trigger to send them off for biopsy. Okay, so I also think if the lesions don't look typical. Yeah, yeah. They, these, all these diseases, they don't look like classic hives. Yeah, yeah. So appearance-wise, if, if they're um, lasting for a longer period of time, if, if the patients can tell me like, no, this specific hive has been there for days, um, and it's not moving, it's not migratory, that, that'd be another reason, I think, to, to send them off. So When you were in fellowship, did you see any of these diseases in immunology clinic? The inflammatory uh, diseases? <laughs> No, no, no. So I don't know you if know, I just wasn't on call at that time, but yeah. Another thing to think about with these diseases is serum sickness um, that can prevent present with um, 
uh, urticaria-like lesions, arthritis, fever, and low complements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Later in the year, Hal Hoffman from UC San Diego, who to my knowledge is sort of the world's expert in inflammasome diseases, uh, he's gonna be a speaker if you're uh, really into these diseases. We've got another topic, another speaker on this. Kes, can I ask a clarifying question? So are you going to be sending C3 and C4 more often in your evaluation for CIU, even though um, that's not typically in like the, the you know, recommendations? Right. Yeah, I, I think, um, no, I don't think so. I, I think if I'm a suspect of, I think I'm gonna be a lot more specific with my questions. Uh, so like if their lesions are not changing, if they have any reason for me to believe that it might be urticarial vasculitis, then I'll send it. But I think for just a blanket screening lab, like kind of sometime, even though it's not necessarily recommended even for chronic spontaneous urticaria, um, I don't, I, I'm not just gonna automatically order um, complement labs necessarily, um, but only if, you know, I'm suspect more of these different types of lesions or their, you know, kind of the clinical characteristics, I think. So. Okay, so thanks for putting that together. Those are, um, you know, for most all of us, pretty esoteric, not the urticarial vasculitis, but the rest of them are truly pretty esoteric diseases that we could probably go a whole career and, and never diagnose. Yeah. but. It, if you keep hearing about it enough times, a little bit of it sticks. Yeah, <laughs> somewhat. All right, any other questions, folks? All right, have a, a good day. All right, take care. Anything new on the new variant of COVID that we're uh, dealing with? No. See it. <laughs> we're never getting out of this. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.